At this time, I'd, I take great pleasure in introducing our next guest. He's a veteran. He's one of the Brotherhood. The Registrar of Deeds, Richard Howe, Jr. Well, thank you, Bob. And uh, if I may be permitted to digress for a moment, first I'd like to congratulate all the veterans from Drake on the great performance of your high school's football accomplishment last night. Drake at High School. The, uh, the team won the Division 1A Super Bowl, beating Marshfield 27 to nothing at Gillette Stadium on a game that was televised on Channel 38. And uh, it wasn't, the result wasn't in doubt after the first couple of minutes, so that was a great accomplishment. I'd also like to put on another hat I wear, and that's as the president of the corporation of Lowell Telecommunications Corporation. And I'd like to congratulate the Lowell Veterans Council, and particularly Bob Page, for uh, winning an award at our annual meeting last month. Uh, it, it was, the award was the best municipal program, and it's for the, the name of the program is Veterans Story. And in it, Bob interviews veterans about their time uh, in the service. It will next be shown this coming Tuesday morning at 9 o'clock on Channel 10 in Lowell, but it's shown repeatedly, and I'd urge you to watch it. Um, three weeks ago today, I found myself in New York City. My wife and I went there to celebrate our 25th wedding anniversary. And uh, although she would prefer me not mentioning it, my wife Roxanne is here with us today, and I point that out because she too is a veteran. She and I first met knee-deep in mud in a forest in Germany during a reforger exercise. And I can attest that one of the keys to a happy marriage is knowing that your wife once qualified as expert on the M16 rifle. <laughs> the uh, reason we went to New York was to see the play South Pacific. And I'm sure everyone in this room is familiar with it. It's a great play. And if you set aside the wonderful music, South Pacific tells the story of the sailors and marines and nurses who fought during uh, the Pacific War after Pearl Harbor and about their struggles and the hardships they endured. But while we were in New York City, we jumped on the subway and we rode down to the lower part of Manhattan and we walked over to the place where the World Trade Center used to stand. There's not much there that now. There's a high fence surrounding what otherwise looks like a construction site. But I think it's important for anybody that goes to New York to visit there, both to remember what happened and to honor the many people that died that day. Now, the reason I bring that up here today at a Pearl Harbor remembrance is that there are really incredible parallels between the attack on Pearl Harbor and the attack on 9-11. They both involved foreign enemies of this country using planes to strike against targets on American soil. They both had as their target symbols of America's strength. In 1941, it was the Pacific Fleet. In 2001, it was the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. In both cases, the attacks came as complete surprises. In both cases, thousands of Americans were killed. And in both cases, our intelligence services had uncovered sufficient clues to allow us to have disrupted or prevented the attacks had we been more vigilant and had we been more alert to the determination and the capabilities of our adversaries. But what I'd like to talk about today is one major difference between Pearl Harbor and 9-11. And that's the way that the American people as a whole reacted afterwards. After Pearl Harbor, there was widespread rationing of gasoline, tires, sugar, coffee, and all of the essential parts of life. The American people after Pearl Harbor embraced recycling, setting aside things like rubber, tin, and even kitchen fat, which turns out to be an important ingredient in explosives. The American people after Pearl Harbor were urged to invest 10% of every paycheck in war bonds, and many did. And the American people after Pearl Harbor, here in, even in Lowell, Massachusetts, thousands of miles beyond the range of the nearest enemy aircraft, every night at dusk drew shut the curtains, lest they be criticized from the street by the blackout warden that roamed the streets every night. Now, through all of these things, large and small, 
Uh, they serve to engage the American people, everybody from the youngest child to the most senior of senior citizens in the war effort. And it created, through this shared sacrifice and commonality of purpose, a determination to see it through to the end. And the country emerged as a stronger and better place. Now contrast that with the aftermath of 9-11. Now certainly there were, there were memorial services and patriotic rallies. Many people packaged care packages. Um, there were uh, people who advocated for veterans. Uh, for the care when they returned. Some of uh, many of our number, including people like Colonel Sam Poulton, actually deployed and fought there. But, and many of the people in this room participated in those very important steps. But just think of the American people as a whole. What were we asked to do? Well, my memory is that I was asked to go to the mall and continue shopping. And the reason for that was that the real target of the terrorist was the American economy and that so much of the economy depended on consumer spending that it was our duty to go out and spend money. Well, what if after 9-11, instead of going out and buying bigger and more gas-guzzling SUVs, we had rationed gasoline and by doing that rid ourselves of our dependence on foreign oil? What about after 9-11, instead of recklessly borrowing money to buy bigger houses, fancier TVs, and more elaborate vacations, we had taken 10% of every paycheck and bought U.S. savings bonds. Or what about after 9-11, instead of clamoring for more and bigger tax cuts, we had demanded a dedicated war tax that would have been spent exclusively to fight the war on terror? Well, I suggest to you that if we had done those things and other things like them, the history of the last seven years would have been quite different and we would not be standing today at the opening act of an economic calamity that's global in its scope. Our friend and departed colleague Henry Champagne devoted his life to ensuring that people remembered Pearl Harbor. Henry's no longer with us and I think it's incumbent upon all of us to carry forth Henry's mission. For if we continue to remember Pearl Harbor, we will always honor the memory of those who served and died there. If we continue to remember Pearl Harbor, we'll always remember to be vigilant and not to underestimate the capabilities and the determination of our enemies. And if we remember Pearl Harbor, we will remember that by making small sacrifices and coming together as a community, we can withstand any challenge that we're faced and that America will emerge as a better and stronger place. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard.